Chapter 2, Section 3. Can so-called anarcho-capitalist theory justify the state? Ironically enough, so-called anarcho-capitalist ideology actually allows the state to be justified along with capitalist hierarchy. This is because the reason why capitalist authority is acceptable to these so-called anarcho-capitalists is because it's voluntary. No one forces the worker to join or remain within a specific company. Force of circumstances are irrelevant from this viewpoint. Thus, capitalist domination is not really domination at all. But the state can be said of all democratic states as well. But the same can be said of all democratic states as well. Few such states bar exit for its citizens. They're free to leave at any time with provisos. Looking at you, America. And join any other state that will have them, exactly as employees can with companies. Of course, there are differences between the two kinds of authority. Anarchists do not deny that, but the similarities are all too clear. The so-called anarcho-capitalists would argue that changing jobs is easier than changing states, and sometimes this is correct, but not always. Yes, changing states does require the moving of home and possessions over great distances, but so can changing jobs. Indeed, if a worker has to move halfway across a country or even the world to get a job, these so-called anarcho-capitalists would celebrate this as an example of the benefits of a flexible labor market. Yes, states often conscript citizens and send them into dangerous situations, but bosses often force their employees to accept dangerous working environments on pain of firing. Yes, many states do restrict freedom of association and speech, but so do bosses. I mean, yes, states tax their citizens, but landlords and companies only let others use their property if they get money in return. Indeed, if the employees or tenant does not provide the employee or landlord with enough profit, they will be quickly shown the door. Of course, employees can start their own companies, but citizens can start their own state if they convince an existing state, the owner of a set of resources, to sell or give land to them. Setting up a company also requires existing owners to sell and give resources to those who need them. Of course, in a democratic state, citizens can influence the nature of laws and the orders that they obey. In a capitalist country, this is not so much the case. This means that logically, the so-called anarcho-capitalisms, uh, ca so this means that logically, so-called anarcho-capitalism must consider a series of freely exitable states as anarchist and not a source of domination. If consent, not leaving, is what's required to make capitalist domination not domination, then the same can be said of statist domination. Stephen L. Newman makes this point. The emphasis that right-wing libertarians place on the opposition of liberty and political power tends to obscure the role of authority in their worldview. The authority exercised in private relationships, however, in the relationship between employer and employee, for instance, meets no objection. This reveals a curious insensitivity to the use of private authority as a means of a social control. Comparing public and private authority, we might as well ask of the right-wing libertarians, when the price of exercising one's freedom is terribly high, what practical difference is there between the commands of the state and those issued by one's employer? Though admittedly the circumstances are not identical, telling disgruntled employers, uh, telling dis uh, disgruntled employers that they are always free to leave their job, employees that they are always free to leave their job, seems no different in principle from telling political dissidents that they're free to emigrate. Liberalism at wit's end, page forty-five, forty-six. Rothbard, in his own way, agrees. If the state may be said to properly own its territory, then it is proper for it to make rules for everyone who presumes to live in that area. It can be legitimately it can legitimately seize or control private property because there is no private property in its area because it really owns the entire land surface. So long as the state permits its subjects to leave its territory, then it can be said to act as does any other owner who sets down rules for people living on his property. The Ethics of Liberty, page 170. Rothbard argues that this is not the case simply because the state did not acquire its property in a just manner and that its claims over virgin land 
both of which violates Rothbard's homesteading theory of property. We'll talk more about this in, the, uh, in section uh, in chapter four, section one. But Rothbard argues that this defense of statism, the state as property owner, is unrealistic and ahistoric. But his account of the origins of property is unweak, un, uh, is equally unrealistic and ahistoric, and that does not stop him from supporting capitalism, people in glass houses, and all of that. Thus, he claims that the state is evil and its claims to authority and power false simply because it acquired the resource it claims to own unjustly, for example, by violence and coercion. See Ethics of Liberty, page 171-71 for Rothbard's attempt to explain why the state should not be considered as the owner of the land. But even if the state was the owner of its territory, it cannot appropriate virgin land. Although, as he notes elsewhere, the vast U.S. frontier no longer exists, and there's no point crying over the fact. Page 240 for that citation. So what makes hierarchy legitimate for Rothbard is whether the property is deri it derives from was acquired justly or unjustly, which leads us to a few very important points. First, Rothbard is explicitly acknowledging the similarities between statism and capitalism. He is arguing that if the state had developed in a just way, then it's perfectly justifiable in governing or setting down rules those who consent to live on its territory in exactly the same way a property owner does. In other words, private property can be considered as a justly created state. These similarities between property and statism have long been recognized by anarchists and is why we reject private property along with the state. Proudhon did, after all, note that property is despotism as well as property is theft. But according to Rothbard, something can look like a state, i.e. be a monopoly of decision-making over an area, and act like a state, set down rules for people, govern them, impose a monopoly of force, but not be a state. But if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. Claiming that the origins of the thing are what counts is irrelevant. For example, a cloned duck is just as much of a duck as a naturally born one. A statist organization is authoritarian whether it comes from just or unjust origins. Does transforming the ownership of the land from states to capitalists really make the relations of domination created by the dispossession of the many less authoritarian and unfree? Of course not. Secondly, much property in actually existing capitalism is the product directly or indirectly of state laws and violence. The emergence of both agrarian and industrial capitalism in Britain and elsewhere, we must add, could not have gotten off the ground without resources of state violence, legal or otherwise. See Brian Morris, Ecology and Anarchism, page 190 for these citations. If state claims of ownership are invalid due to their history, then so are many others, particularly those to which claim to own land. As the initial creation was Ill illegitimate, so are the transactions which have sprung from it. Thus, if state claims of property rights are invalid, so are most, if not all, capitalist claims. If the laws of the state are illegitimate, so are the rules of capitalism. If taxation is illegitimate, then so are rent, interest, and profit. Rothbard's historical argument against the state can also be applied to private property, and if the one is unjustified, so is the other. Thirdly, if the state had evolved justly, then Rothbard would have actually had nothing against it. A strange position for an anarchist to take. Logically, this means that if a system of corporate states evolved from the workings of a capitalist market, then the so-called anarcho-capitalist would have nothing against it. This can be seen from these so-called anarcho-capitalist support for company towns, even, if, even though they have correctly been described as industrial feudalism. Fourthly, Rothbard argue, uh, Rothbard's argument implies that similar circumstances producing similar relationships of domination and unfreedom are somehow different if they are created by just and unjust means. Rothbard claims that because the property is justly acquired, it means the authority a capitalist over his employees is totally different from that of a state over its subject. But such a claim has to be false. Both the subject citizen and the employee are in a similar relationship of domination and authoritarianism. 
As we just previously argued in section uh, section two of this chapter, how a person got into a situation is irrelevant when considering how free they are. Thus, the person who consents to be governed by another because all available resources are privately owned is in exactly the same situation as a person who has to join a state because all available resources are owned by one state or another. Both are unfree and part of authoritarian relationships based upon domination. And lastly, while these so-called anarcho-capitalism may be a just society, it's definitely not a free one. It will be marked by extensive hierarchy, unfreedom, and government, but these restrictions of freedom will be of a private nature. As Rothbard indicates, the property owner and the state create share in the same uh, authoritarian relationships. If statism is unfree, and then so is capitalism. And have to add now, how just is a system which undermines liberty? Can justice ever be met in a society in which one class has more power and freedom than another? If one party is in an inferior position, then they have little choice but to agree to the disadvantageous terms offered by the superior party. In such a situation, a just outcome will be unlikely as any contract agreed will be skewed to, one favor, uh, to favor one side over the other. The implications of these points are important. We can easily imagine a situation within the so-called uh, so anarcho-capitalist system where a few companies and people start to buy up land and form company regions and towns. After all, this has happened continually throughout capitalism. Thus, a natural process may develop where a few owners start to accumulate larger and larger and larger tracts of land justly. Such a process does not need to result in one company owning the world. It's likely that a few hundred, perhaps a few thousand, could do so. But this is not a cause for rejoicing. After all, the current market in unjust states also has a few hundred competitors in it. And even if there is a large multitude of property owners, the situation for the working class is exactly the same as a citizen under current statism. Does the fact that it's justly acquired property that faces the worker really change the fact that they must submit to the government and rules of another to gain access to the means of life? When faced with anarchist criticisms that circumstances force workers to accept wage slavery, the so-called anarcho-capitalist claims that these are to be considered as objective facts of nature. And so wage labor is not classified as domination. However, the same can be said of states – we're born into a world where states claim to own all the available land. If states are replaced by individuals or groups of individuals, does this, not, does this change the essential nature of dispossession? Rothbard argues that, obviously in a free society, Smith has the ultimate decision-making power over his own just property, Jones over his, etc., page 173. And equally obviously, this ultimate decision-making power extends to those who use but do not own such property. But how free is a free society where the majority have to sell their liberty to another in order to live? Rothbard correctly argues that the state uses its monopoly of force to control, regulate, and coerce its hapless subjects. Often it pushes its way into controlling the morality and the very lives of its subjects. However, he then fails to note that employers do the exact same thing to their employees. This, from an anarchist perspective, is unsurprising, for after all, the employer is the ultimate decision-making power over his property, just as the state is over its unjust property. This, that similar forms of control and regulation develop is not surprising, given the similar hierarchical relationships in both structures. That there is a choice available in states does not make statism any less just or unjust or unfree or free. Similarly, just because we have a choice between employers does not make wage labor any less unjust or unfree. But trying to dismiss one form of domination as flowing from just property while attacking the other because it flows from unjust property is not seeing the wood for the trees. If one reduces liberty, so does the other. Whether the situation we're in resulted from just or unjust is irrelevant to the restrictions of freedom we face because of them. And as we argue in section 2.5, unjust situations can easily flow from just steps. 
the so-called anarcho-capitalist's insistence that the voluntary nature of an association determines whether it is anarchistic is deeply flawed. So flawed, in fact, that states and state-like structures, such as capitalist firms, can be considered anarchistic. In contrast, actual anarchists think that the hierarchical nature of the associations we join is equally as important as its voluntary nature when determining whether it is anarchistic or statist. However, this option is not available to these so-called anarcho-capitalists as it logically entails that capitalist companies are to be opposed along with the state as sources of domination, oppression, and exploitation.